Bandwidth for this podcast is brought to you by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Welcome back to MacBreak Studio. I'm um, just shining up my new uh, birthday present, the new Mac Pro. So in this lesson, we're going to look at and examine the performance of this setup with the Mac Pro and this uh, Pegasus R8. And I think you want to talk a little bit about just out of, out of the box, what can this thing do? Yeah, I really want to get a little more into what these peripherals are and why you might want to consider them. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're going to do a separate episode that goes deep into performance, but since we did tease you a little last time because we set everything up, but we didn't actually play anything because we just wanted to kind of show you how it all comes together. Um, we do have a project here, so just a sense of where we're going to be going over the next couple episodes. This project here is a music video shoot that was shot uh, in 4K with red cameras, and right now I have in the angle viewer four separate angles of red, and I'll prove this all to you later, but take it on my word now, but I will prove it all to you um, later. So this is four angles that I'm going to play back, and this is this is optimized red footage. It's 4K, and I'm going to play it back uh, in real time. So let's check it out. Okay. Right, so um, there we see we've got four streams of 4K playing back simultaneously uh, in, in the angle viewer. So this machine, in combination with the Pegasus RAID and Thunderbolt 2 technology, is able to do this while we're monitoring at, at 4K. So um, I think what we should do, we've got a lot more we're going to talk about performance, but I think we should take a little bit of a step back and break down where the performance is coming from. I think that's an uh, excellent idea. Because it's really... Um, in many cases, it may not be necessary to get this big a setup for what your own personal workflow is. Uh, there's a lot you can do with an iMac or with, a, with a, a laptop and with single drives. So before we talk about this guy, I think we should talk a little bit about Thunderbolt 2 because everything here, well, this is connected by HDMI right now, but everything else is connected by Thunderbolt, right? And specifically Thunderbolt 2. So um, what's the difference between Thunderbolt 2 and Thunderbolt 1? Um, the pipe? I mean, how much data you can fit there? I, on? Well, how much data? Yeah. So, what what everybody talks about is Thunderbolt One is 10 gigabits per second, and Thunderbolt Two is 20 gigabits per second. But um, we should peel that back a little bit because there's a little more information underneath that. So, um, actually, Thunderbolt One is also capable of 20 gigabits per port. The thing is, what Thunderbolt uh, One has is two channels within that port. One channel is the PCI Express, it's basically all the data, and one channel is for the video display, it's a display port. So it, it takes those two channels, and there's an aggregate total of 20 gigabits of throughput for that port, right. but for each channel, it's half. So you're saying like data playing video, you're only going to get a theoretical maximum of 10 gigabits, 10 gigabits per yeah. second, right? Okay. Yeah. And for video, you're going to get a max of 10. And it's video that's more important, because for, for, for video, for data, when we say with video, it's more important. I meant for display. I mean for the display. That's what you meant. I mean for display. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, for the display, it's actually the display that is taking more bandwidth than the data does in most cases. Sure. So, um, so how does the Thunderbolt so, 2 bridge this? How yeah, does it get so, around this? So it, what they did with Thunderbolt 2, it's, they call it channel bonding, where they've taken and, and enabled both of those channels to carry all of the display data or all of the video data. Right, you know, so you can have all 20 gigabit pipe for just display then, yes. basically. Yes, and that's the thing that enables 4K uh, output. As, output. Right. Got it, got that's it. That's the thing that enables it. So um, it's not so much for the data, moving all this this red data, whether it's so, raw so optimized. So the person out there that's watching this, well, I, I don't need to monitor 4K. I, I can go with Thunderbolt 1 and be right, fine. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, if you want to drive a 4K monitor, you either need a Mac Pro or the, the latest um, Mac Retina Book Displays Pro. MacBook Pros, the latest MacBook Pros, late 2013, that have Thunderbolt 2 uh, and HDMI. You can actually do HDMI out to this monitor. Nice. Okay. So that's kind of part one, is that Thunderbolt 2 doesn't increase the total capacity, but it combines it so they can all that, all that capacity can be used by either display or by data, and it's really important for display to be able to use that full pipe. I see. So the second thing that comes into play, if you look at these ports down here uh, on the Mac Pro, there's six ports, 
but behind the scenes, there's actually three buses uh, for those ports, three buses or three controllers. In other words, there are really two ports per bus or two ports per, per controller. And the way it works is that um, the top two, on, not the top two, but the top one in the top left corner and the one behind it, uh, sorry, the one beneath it, so uh, the stack of the top two in the on the left are bus one, the stack of the top two on the right are bus two, and then what gets interesting is the two at the very bottom across constitute bus zero in combination with the HDMI port. Interesting. So the HDMI port and those two bottom ports all uh, constitute a single bus. What this means, for data it doesn't matter. You can plug in to any port that you want. But if you're driving a 4K display, you, you generally want to make sure that you're not plugging another display or really another, another data feed into uh, a port on that same bus. I see, because okay. you'll be limiting that bus. Yeah, you'll be you, limiting the throughput right. of that bus. It, th that bus needs its capacity to drive a 4K I monitor. See. So you have to be very uh, clear about what these buses are and where you're, yep. what you're plugging into them, is what you're saying. Exactly, and Apple has a great support document that kind of lines that out. I saw and a little, have a little diagram and everything. Exactly, kind of exactly. That's so excellent. maybe we'll post that under the movie there uh, so people can see that. If you're driving a monitor like this, this is the Apple Thunderbolt display, the mm -hmm. 2560 by 1440, you can plug in six of these, you no know, and drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, I'd want to. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, uh, my friend Logan, who, who, who's editing in this full setup, has two Thunderbolt displays for Final Cut Pro, mm -hmm. one for uh, the interface, one for the viewer, and then one. Then he monitors on the Sharp 32 inch. So he's using all those, but you just have to be careful about which ports you use. Um, that said, you can, when you're dealing with data, like this Pegasus you mentioned, you can daisy chain six of these devices off of one port and you'll get 20 gigabits of throughput, which by the way is, you'll never saturate that bus. You will never come close to it in terms of the amount of data that needs to be pushed through it. So the point is that while this is great that this is Thunderbolt 2, um, really in my mind, this is personal opinion, the, the main benefit of that is you could hang a 4K monitor off of this. That's right. You know, and even, I don't even know if I'd do that because then it's, it's going through it's you know that same it's that same bus. So the main the main thing to me is uh, it's future proofing for whatever future data speeds we'll be able to get from faster drives. Sure, sure. Um, but uh, if you're on a Thunderbolt one machine, you're going to be fine from a data perspective. Moving even if you're doing 4K, you're going to be you're going to be really fine. It's really the display thing. Do I need yeah. 4K? Which brings up the question, which I'm sure you want to answer. All. What's the advantage of having this 4K on the desktop yeah, then? If, yeah. I, if, it, if I don't really need it, I'm not doing 4K, why would I want this? Why would you want to be able to do this? Right, yes. so, so let's talk about that first and then we'll come back to this guy. Sure. So, so just briefly, well one, one thing in my mind after hooking this up, it's just, it's gorgeous. It is, <laughs> You know, it's, it's huge and gorgeous. So I just like immediately, once I saw that, I want to work with this all the time. So I'm seeing a pixel for pixel representation of my playback so that, of 4K I'm gonna, material. I'm going to repeat you. Pixel for pixel, that, I've heard that term before, and that's important when you want to really check your focus, your accuracy of focus, and what, what have you, and as opposed to having it like res down or downscaled or what have you, yeah. you're seeing it the way it was right, shot. Right, now, now, the thing to be, to, I should clarify, is that's, that's true, I'm not necessarily going to color grade based on this monitor. I'm, this is not like a monitor that I'm going to sit there and grade for broadcast, for example. That's a really good point. Um, some people think, well, what, what it will then, if that's true, what do I grade on? Right, and so um, I chatted with Alexis Van Herkman, our, our uh, grading Alexis, expert. Alexis, our grading guru, yes. Our grading guru, and um, what he told me is most people who are doing 4K when they're doing professional color correction, they are actually downsampling their output to an HD, you know, 1920, 1080 monitor right. that is a calibrated. professional calibrated and very expensive monitor, mm -hmm. and the algorithms, like for instance in Resolve, algorithms, are algorithms, algorithms for mm -hmm. doing that scaling, that right. down, that downsampling, are very, very oh, good. Oh, you wouldn't believe the controls in Resolve for uh, upsampling, downsampling. I mean, it's it's amazing yeah. what's built into it. So that's generally what they're doing right now. I, I would say down the road that, that, that you'll be doing this as prices come down and mm -hmm. these get more popular. So I wouldn't use it for color correction, but just for for, for checking focus, for impressing. <laughs> I mean, and client, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. And honestly, even if you're not doing 4K, check this out. Um, if you're doing things like time lapse. Well, wait a minute, I'm sorry. To, yeah. I mean, you don't have to use this monitor. If you want, you can get a 4K projector and you can, yep. you can edit. <laughs> you can yeah, throw everything so. you're doing up on a big screen, though, right? I guess so. I guess oh, so. No, I'm not, I'm yeah. sure I would want to do that. Yeah. That would be more impressive to me as a client. 
Okay. Right? Well, I, I, I think this thing's beautiful. I don't know. Yeah, and, it, is, and this, it is. And just you throw photographs because your photographs that you're shooting with the DSLR are going to be, you know, very high definition. And they look, I think they look absolutely stunning on this on the screen. So just about anything you shoot. And these are just some behind the scenes of, a, of that video shoot that we did. Okay. Um, so that's a couple reasons you may want the monitor. Not for color correction so much, but for monitoring, for pixel for pixel output of your, um, of your work. Mm -hmm. Now, why would you want to spend the amount of money that one of these things costs? $3,600. $3,600 for this particular configuration, sure. right? And you can get cheaper, higher. Yeah. And in my mind, the primary reason is uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got a ton of footage, like we talked about um, these, these uh, 21 terabytes effectively right. in this particular thing, and that stores a ton of footage of HD or even 4K. Well, that brings up a question. How much 4K footage could I store on this? Well, it, it depends. <laughs> like the economist on one hand, on the other hand. So, it, for example, for the red, for the red stuff that we're shooting, uh, you know, red has you can you can shoot at multiple different quality levels mm -hmm. yeah. and multiple frame rates. But the stuff that we shot, um, and including optimized media, because generally when you optimize your media, you're creating files that are three times as big as the original mm -hmm. ones, and including proxy media. Sure. All of that together, if you include all of that, you can you can store roughly 40 hours of red footage on this eight drive. Wow, with optimized device. and props, proxy together. Yeah, with that's, all that. That's, yeah, that's, a, that's it, just, real roughly 240 uh, hours. That's just like out of the ballpark. You know, if 40. you're using if it's ProRes HQ, if you're doing 1920 yeah. by 1080 ProRes HQ, you're talking about 200 hours. Wow. So it's a lot, and you can daisy, you can absolutely daisy change these. So there's like no limit. You're not going to fill. You're not going to this tiny cable. You're not going to saturate the bandwidth available on this cable um, with these machines. Nice. You know, so you can just use a ton of them. Yeah. Fantastic. So um, so one reason is capacity. Um, the other reason is the redundancy. So there aren't many uh, large drive, multi-bay drives like this that are capable of RAID five. Right, right, and what you, what's the real benefit here is you get the speed, the throughput, and you get the redundancy. Yes. As opposed to you can get them other RAID configurations where it's all speed. Right. But, but like, RAID 5, you get, you, like you said, you'll never oversaturate this yes, pipe. Yes, yes. So why not leave it in RAID 5? It just makes sense. So, but honestly, for me, here's, yes. a, here's, a, here's a counter example. Um, my data, I'm kept, I have on cards, and I make camera archives, mm -hmm. and that's my backup. Sure. So, um, for me, I might spend less money for a drive that's RAID 0, which is super fast, but there's no redundancy, so it has a chance of failing, sure. but I know I have backups. Sure. It's more of a hassle if it fails. I mean, the nice thing about this, if a, backup, if a drive fails, you keep working. You pop it out and put it in. Right. So if you're in a serious production environment, this is what you want. You, you don't want any downtime. For me, as an independent guy, it might be less expensive for me to get a less expensive drive and then if it fails, go to my backups and rebuild. Sure. It, it, you know, it's, it's a tough call, because sure. that, co that could cost me hours of downtime of doing that, of right. dealing with that. And is that, is so, that worth the money you're going to spend right. just to have this? Yeah, right, or, or buy a smaller configuration. Because yeah. other things, you buy the four bay, yeah. and then you can add to them. That's yeah. the kind of cool things you, yeah, can, I, you can I just add bought, to them. I just bought a four bay, four bay terabyte, um, you know, the first version of this, and I have it hooked up to my iMacs, and it, it's, it's, I've never had a problem with like throughput on it, and it's, it's, it's great. Two of yeah. my iMacs are, are Thunderbolt 1, and my MacBook yep. Pro is Thunderbolt 2, and it works on all of them really well. well. You, you make a good point that this isn't required to do it with the Mac Pro. That's right. And the Mac Pro is this uh, the amazing machine, but this this works great in all kind of even you know with a laptop, iMac, whatever. Sure. So um, and that it's would cool be cool black. And it's a cool black. Yes. Yeah, it, it looks great. I think it's made to match the Mac Pro. Yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to get a couple of ideas about there about Thunderbolt. What's the primary? Um, uh, data and display issues going through mm -hmm. the Thunderbolt and some reasons why you might want to consider these peripherals in the system. I see. Yep. Um, so next time, we'll really get into looking at the performance of a Final Cut Pro with this setup. You know, before we go, um, wasn't there, isn't there some sort of software that you get with this? Oh, that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, there is. So when, and we should, that brings me something else. We just plugged this in and started working with it, but if you think I'm going to go out tomorrow and buy it and start running, there's something you need to know. There is a synchronization process this needs to go through. So when you first buy it and turn it on, it immediately starts synchronizing, and this one took overnight. I don't know exactly how long. I, I got it, the time it really of 10 depends, hours. You know, it so depends, my, did, yeah. I, my little you know, four bay, it literally took three days to synchronize. And that was, a, that was an older model, yeah, I guess one, sure. so I don't, they might have done something different, but this thing, this eight bay and overnight was ready to go. Yeah. 
And it, all, it comes with this uh, utility right here. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because rather than just believe what I'm saying, if we look at the physical drives, you can see here uh, that there are eight, eight, drives, eight drives and they're each three terabyte. And you can see uh, in the disk array that we've got a 24 terabyte disk array. But then if we look at the logical drive, which is after it's rated, right. it's a 21 terabyte total capacity in RAID 5. Right. Exactly. Okay, so that just sort of tells you, and this this utility you can use to do all kinds of. But, by the way, uh, something else too. Yeah. I'm going to cut you off, but if you if while it's synchronizing, if you click the background activities, it'll tell you at what percentage. Okay. There's a little bar that'll say it's at five percent, ten percent, twenty percent. Okay. And it, That's right. You can right. just launch it, and it'll let you know. And by the way, I should you can use it right away. You just won't get the best performance out of it sure. because after it's building parity uh -huh. amongst the drives, and it won't be at full performance until that's done. Sure. But you you can immediately buy it and start loading data onto it. Yes, you absolutely can. Absolutely. So uh, a couple ideas about these and then so next time we'll really get into the nitty-gritty of using Final Cut Pro with a Mac Pro, with a Pegasus RAID, and then the monitor doesn't matter as much for performance right. reasons. Sure. We'll kind of just focus on this configuration for that. Excellent. So like Mark said, we'll do that in the next lesson of Mac Break Studio.